All right, hello and welcome, fellow users of the internet. My name is Nolan. You're watching Asphodel Merchants. All right, it's the next one in this series. We're doing the tier list for Wilds of Eldraine Limited, and now is time for green. Get these to where they're big enough. I like to read them. Yeah, okay. We're going to start off this size with Agatha's Champion. Four colorless and a green for a human knight. It's a 4-4. Four -four. It's got bargain. And it's got Trample. When Agatha's Champion enters the battlefield, if it was bargained, it fights up to one target creature you don't control. I think that I'm going to talk myself into giving an A for Agatha's Champion. It's always nice to have those, uh, what's, it's, it alliteration, what it is, consonants, what if it's vowels. But, uh, no, this card's just good. There's, uh, not too big. No other... Oh my gosh, I'm such a dork. But anyway, yeah, this card's really good. Uh, you know, it'd be a little bit much to be just put in 5-mana 4-4 four, four tramples in our deck, but they'd still get the job done most of the time. But it really shouldn't be hard to bargain this particular spell, as easy it is to make food in green, and as easy it is uh, to make a lot of the tokens, I mean, uh, the rolls, that is. And so, all that put together should be really easy to always do this, and it'll win pretty much any fight it gets into the heat fight. But yeah, A for Agatha's Champion. Alright, next our, uh, next card is not as impressive. We've got Bean Stalk Worm. Four colorless and a green for a plant worm. It's a 5-4, and it's got reach. And it's also got an adventure part called Plant Beans. Colorless and a green for a sorcery. You may play an additional land this turn. This card... I think it's going to be a C, because, like, 5-4 reach is still good stats, but, uh, this is not a very impressive adventure, like, at all. So, I don't, I don't really like this card. Um, next up, we've got Bestial Bloodline, Colless and a green for an enchantment aura, enchant creature, enchanter creature gets plus two, plus two, four Colless and a green, return Bestial Bloodline from your graveyard to your hand. Um, I think this card is a D, just like, you know, Blood Rage is not really what I think we want to be doing with our decks. I think there are more powerful options that we're going to have in this limited format. And the, the, the idea is that you're supposed to sacrifice this to your bargain and then pay five and get it back. And so you didn't really lose it, but I really can't imagine there are very many games where you're just going to be sitting around with five mana and nothing to do and put this back in your hand. So, I'm going to give a D to be sure Bloodline, but maybe I'm wrong. Alright, next up is a card I'm definitely worried about. Um, you know, not in a fun way or anything. Oh, man. Sorry, the flies are on my desk. Blossoming Tortoise. Two colorless and green green for a creature that's a turtle. It's a 3-3. Three, three. When it enters the battlefield or attacks, mill three cards, then return a land card from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. Activated abilities of lands you control cost one less to activate. Land creatures you control get plus one, plus one. So, those last two, the last three lines are flavor text if you don't get one of the rare lands to go with it. And even with that being said, I mean, you have to get either the green-black one or the green-blue one to even play it that easily with your double green pit mythic. I think this card really sucks. Like, it's four mana for a 3-3 three, three with no evasion, and, like, even to attack with it, you mill yourself for six, it's a 3-3. Three, three. So to kill your opponent just with this going coast to coast, you have to mill 21 cards. No, 24 cards. Like, half your deck. Uh, I am given a D to Blossoming Tortoise. You might play it if you are strapped for playables, but, like, it is trending towards F. You should maybe actually think about avoiding this card. Like, I... Ugh, I might put this in F later. Alright, next up we've got Bramble Familiar. Colorless and a green for a creature. It's an elemental raccoon that's a 2-2. It has tap, add one green, and it has colorless and a green. Discard a card, return Bramble Familiar to your owner's hand. Well, why would you want to do that? Well, that way you get to cast the adventure part of it. Fetch Quest. Five colorless and green green for a sorcery. Mill seven cards and... Then put a creature, enchantment, or land card from among the mill cards onto the battlefield. 
So the whole idea is you've played your Bramble Familiar, you've ramped up to everything, and then after that somehow you get to 7 mana and you decide, okay, it's time to discard my 8th land probably, I guess, and now I'm going to cast Fetch Quest, which should find you some more action, uh, and so maybe that'll do it. Overall, though, you know, 2 green, I mean, sorry, Call a Center Green for tap one green is pretty good. Uh, you know, you're not really going to be cutting this from your green decks. That way you can, you know, play faster than your opponent. I'm going to give a B to Bramble Familiar. It'll, maybe it'll play closer to a C, but I'm sure that uh, I am going to probably force myself to try to play Fetch Quest if this card ever makes it in my deck. Alright, next up is Brave the Wilds. One green for a sorcery. It's got Bargain. And if this spell was bargained, target land you control becomes a 3-3 elemental creature with haste that's still land. Search your library for a basic land card and put it into your hand, then shuffle. Okay, so this is a lay of the land with some upside. If you cast it, you know, later than turn one, you need to turn one of your lands into a 3-3, which there's a certain sweet spot to where uh, this should be able to attack through most of whatever your opponent's got. Or you've got so many lands you don't care to throw one away. Um, at its floor, Lay of the Land is normally a playable magic card in most of these formats. Helps you splash. Helps you, you know, hit your cards on turn. Uh, there's maybe some world where you're playing green-red and you want your uh, sorcery and instant count to be a little bit higher than normal. So I'm going to give this a C for Brave the Wilds. And I wouldn't be surprised if it plays a little bit higher. Alright, next up we've got Commune with Nature. I'm pretty sure this is a reprint, isn't it? One green for a sorcery. Look at the top five cards of your library. You may reveal a creature card from among them. Put it into your hand. Put the rest in the bottom of your library in any order. Um, you can still kind of miss. I feel like there was a better version of this card that lets you get a land, but you didn't uh, mill it as deep. Five cards. We've kept a seven card hand. That's 30, 30-ish 30 cards left. As long as you've got six creatures left in your deck, but your deck's probably going to have more creatures than that. You should hit. Uh, I'm going to give... Oh man, I just... I think I just want to give this card a D. I, I'm just not impressed. Like, I think if you just had any other middling creature, you'd just rather play it. Like, looking at five to find a creature, it's just not draw a card. I'm, I'm just... I'm not in. All right. Next up, we've got Curse of the Werefox, two colorless and a green for a sorcery. Create a monster roll token attached to target creature you control. When you do, that creature fights up to one target creature you don't control. This card is an A. It is our, you know, generic green fight spell that has, you know, keyword from the set. And uh, it's going to probably play pretty good. I mean, I've definitely cast me some Hunt the Week. Which is uh, four mana for a sorcery. Put a plus one, plus one counter on a creature. It fights start a creature. Paying one less. And uh, for it to be a sorcery is mm, a little middling. But you always... Uh, the roll token giving it tramples. Pretty good. In case I haven't read it yet. The monster roll token is the one that gives plus one, plus one, and hash trample. Alright. A for Curse of the Werefox. Next up we have Elvish Archivist. One colorless in a green... For an elf artificier. It's a 0-1, but don't worry, it gets better, because whenever one or more artifacts enters the battlefield under your control, put two plus one plus one counters on Elvish Archivist. Disability triggers only once each turn, and whenever one or more enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, draw a card. Disability triggers only once each turn. Oh. So we've got an enchantress makes bigger kind of card. It's pretty cool. Do be warned, one toughness creatures, I am certain, are pretty vulnerable in this format because we've already seen, like, Rat Out, which deals with one toughness creatures in black, and Flick a Coin deals with them in red for not much about, for not much of a problem. So, you definitely want to hold this card and be able to put an artifact into play. If you could somehow play this, wait until you can play this card, play an artifact, buff up buff up its power, and then also get another enchantment on the field to draw a card. You're really going to be doing it. You almost want to think of this as like a, a two-mana spell that you have to have like four lands in play to get to cast. So, 
there is definitely that to consider. Overall, I think there's just enough to make this card an A, but I could also see this card not playing out very well. Uh, a for the Archivist, and let's keep moving on. All right, Feral Encounter. Green, green for a sorcery. Look at the top five cards of your library. You may exile a creature card from among them. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. You may cast the exile card this turn. At the beginning of the next combat phase this turn, target creature you control deals damage equal to its power up to one target creature you don't control. Man, uh, I don't know how many A-pluses we're going to have in here, but I, I just like Feral Encounter. It's, you know, it is a card advantage spell. You know, you can get something else. But if nothing else, you always get the combat, delayed combat step trigger where you get a rabid bite. So it's just double green for a rabid bite all the time. And, you know, maybe double green for cast the best card in your top five and get a rabid bite. It's really good. Feral Encounter is a cool one. All right, next up we got Ferocious Werefox. Three colorless and a green for a creature. It's an Elf Fox Warrior. That's one heck of a text line. It's a 4-3, rich trample, and it's also got an adventure. It's got guard change, color center green for an instant. Create a monster roll token attached to target creature you control. I think that I'm going to give Ferocious Werefox a B. Might be giving this card a little bit too much credit, but I do think it's good. Uh, colorless and a green for a uh, roll token seems pretty effective. These are the kind of adventures you want to card you have where you get a little bit of advantage and then you get a threat left over. Mm, you know, this feels like it's just doing a lot for a common. I'm going to give it a B to a Fox. Alright, next up we've got Graceful Takedown. Colorless and a green for a sorcery. Any number of target enchanted creatures you control and up to one other target creature you control each deal damage equal to their power to target creature you don't control this card's really good it's a very solid a i think it might be trending toward a plus uh it's cool to note that since if you get to target with enough creatures like if you have an enchanted creature and another creature that are enough to kill one thing if they kill the enchanted creature you still get the spell so this card's pretty sweet i'm really liking the takedown Put it in your deck. All right, next up, we've got Gruff Triplets. Bleh. Three colorless and triple green for a creature, Seder Warrior. It's 3-3, three, three, but it does have lots of text on it. It's got Trample, and when Gruff Triplet enters the battlefield, if it isn't a token, create two tokens that are copies of it. When Gruff Triplet dies, put a number of plus one, plus one counters equal to its power on each creature you control named Guff Triplets. This is an A+. It's a very powerful card. You have it's six mana for three, three, three tramples. And then you can get two six sixes and then a 12, 12 left over. So your opponent's got to have three removal spells to deal with this thing. It is a house. All right, and next up we have Hamlet Glutton. Five colorless and two green for a creature. It's a giant. It's a 6-6. Six, six. Um, it's got bargain. And if you do bargain it, this spell costs two less to cast. And it's got trample. And when it enters the battlefield, you gain three life. Um, I want to give a B to Hamlet Glutton. If you can actually bargain this thing, which shouldn't be this hard in this format from what we've seen. I've got to work on. Hold on just a second. What else am I watching? Yeah, I like Def Leppard. My computer is weird, and it cuts off my scroll bar a lot. Dead gummit. Please forgive me, dear viewer, for my technical difficulties. Just been messing with it, cutting off every other time, but not anymore. Yeah, muy perfecto. All right. Yeah, and uh, that is Hamlet Glutton. Gains you three life. I feel like you're always going to want a copy of this card in your green decks. 
It's a great threat, and it gains you three life. If you're ever behind, it's a great blocker, gets you back in the game, and can kill your opponent pretty quick. Hamlet Glutton's a B. It's probably actually trending towards an A. I could almost see this being the best performer in common, but that might be a little bit of a... Uh, That might be a little aggressive. All right, next up we've got Hollow Scavenger. Two colorless and a green for a creature. It's a wolf. It's a 3-2, and it has one colorless. Sacrifice a food. Hollow Scavenger gets plus two, plus two until end of turn. Activate only once each turn. At first, I thought this said only as a sorcery, and I thought, wow, why would they just make a card that bad on purpose again? But, uh... With that being said, it's also got an adventure. It has Bakery Raid, one green for a sorcery. Create a food token. This card is really good. Uh, I think I'm going to call it our best C at the moment. I could almost see this card performing in B range, but, you know, making a food is good. Um, probably depending on how well your deck uses food, because you probably don't want to just use it for Hollow Scavenger. But uh, just making the food and having 3-2 left over is probably going to be pretty good a lot of the time. But C for Hollow Scavenger. We'll see. All right, next up we have Howling Gale Fang. Two colorless and a green for a 4-4 four -four creature beast. It's got Vigilance, and Howling Gale Fang has haste as long as you own a card in exile that has an adventure. Uh, and I... Am I going to give this card an A? I can't have that many A's yet, can I? Yeah, yeah, I think I can. Yeah, because this thing is just redonkulous. 4 mana, 4-4 four, four Vigilance is really good, and if it has haste, like, I mean, yeah, Questing Beast is calling. Have you ever heard of it? Nah, yeah, Questing Beast was a silly card, but this is a really good uncommon. I'm, yeah, it might only perform like a B, but I'm probably going to be a little generous. But we'll, we'll see what I think as we keep going. Alright, next up is the Huntsman Redemption. Two colors and a green for a Saga. Um, chapter 1, create a 3-3 three, three green beast creature token. Chapter 2, you may sacrifice a creature. If you do, search your library for a creature or basic land card, reveal it and put it in your hand, then shuffle. And Chapter 3, up to 2 target creatures, each get plus 2, plus 2, and gain trample until end of turn. Alright, this card is really, really good. I'm going to give it an A. Hopefully, you have are going to be able to sacrifice something a little bit dopier than your 3-3 three, three green beast to uh, trigger that search ability. Oh, man, sorry. Tried to kill that fly again. I missed. So, like I said, hopefully you'll have something else other than that 3-3. Three, three uh, but, I mean, then you get to go just get the best card in your deck, one of those A's, like your top uncommon or your best rare. And so that's really good. And then the up to two target creature get plus two, plus two, and trample in hill in turn. So that's at least, you know makes your 3-3 three, three, a 5-5 five, five on turn 6 and pumps up something else to get into the attack. It's amazing. All right. And so something I was thinking about, and, you know, this, this is the real reason you watch these, to get these little special information about cards and magic from me. So you can actually, whenever something is, whenever a saga goes on Chapter 3, you actually have an opportunity to use the enchantment before it gets sacrificed. So follow me here for a second. Whenever you draw your card, the third chapter, the third lore counter is put on the enchantment, and then the ability goes on the stack. The actual enchantment doesn't get sacrificed until the ability resolves. So you can actually sacrifice sagas to a card with bargain as long as they're instant speed before you sacrifice the enchantment. So just keep that in mind i don't know uh how often it'll come up but uh i am definitely looking forward to making that interaction happen all right all right is there a technical difficulty i think i try to open the door all right, next up we have Leaping Ambush. One green for an instant target creature gets plus one, plus three, and gains reach until end of turn, untap it. Okay, so weird thing is this doesn't seem like a B, but every time we have seen this one green target creature gets a slight staff buff, gains reach, untap it card, it has been like 
the top performing common in that limited format. Like, Arachnid Adaptation was one of the best cards in March of the Machines. There was a card just like it in, uh, not all be one I think it was in, I want to say it was in Brothers War, there was a card almost just like this, and it was one of the best green commons. It, I really don't think it should be performed like a B, but it just always works out that way. So the numbers are just on Leaping Ambush's side. I'm going to give it a B right now. Uh, this, this is probably one of the hardest sells, and it's hard for me to explain why, but more likely than not, my intuition is telling me this card is just going to overperform. All right, we've got a weird one next. We've got Knight of the Sweets Revenge. Three colors and a green for an enchantment. When Knight of the Sweets Revenge enters the battlefield, create a food token. Foods you control have tap, add one green. And it's got an activated, activated ability of five colorless, green, green, sacrifice Knight of Sweets Revenge. Creatures you control get plus X, plus X till end of turn, where X is the number of foods you control. Activate only as a sorcery. <sighs> okay, so here's the thing. It gives a stat boost, but it doesn't give any evasion. So you play this on turn four, and your opponent knows just, like, when this is coming eventually. So they're going to prepare for it a little bit better. They're going to make trades. They're going to use up the removal spells or hold up mana. I think I'm going to just have to give Knight of Sweet Revenge a D. If you can make just, like, an absolute ton of these kinds of tokens maybe but i i'm not sold not in the slightest i got nef i don't know if anybody's paying that close attention but i'm putting blossoming tortoise in the f now all right next up we have red tooth genealogist two colorless and a green for a creature elf advisor it's a two three and when it enters the battlefield, create a royal roll token attached to another target creature. That's plus one, plus one, and ward one. And this card's a C. Uh, yeah, two, three with a little bit of upside is not that amazing. But not bad either. All right, next up we have a Red Tooth Vanguard. One colorless and a green for a creature. It's an elf warrior. It's a three, one, and has trample. But also... Whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, you may pay two. If you do, return Red Tooth Vanguard from your graveyard to your hand. Um, do I want to give this card a B? Because I do think it's a little bit better than a C. Uh, two mana, three one trample, like is going to trade, but it's going to also deal a little bit of damage, and you should be putting plenty of enchantments, and you know. Having two mana up to buy it is like enough, but it's not all that unreasonable. Just like, yeah, I am going to put it in B. I could maybe accept that I'm wrong, but I feel like this will be an all-star in some of the really aggressive decks. And it just, in my opinion, something kind of with this stat line has just been pretty powerful before. So, all right, uh, next up is Return from the Wilds. Two colorless and a green for a sorcery. Choose two. Search your library for a base clan card. Put it on the battlefield. Tap, then shuffle. Create a 1-1 one, one white human creature token or create a food token. See, my issue with this card is this feels like an okay card, but it is going to be played in some very bad decks, and so I will end up having an overall lower opinion of it so this card's going to have a way worse rep than it actually is i think with that being said it's not really going to perform better than a c but i feel like it's going to be a c that really draws your deck together a lot of the time and especially if you're trying to splash a color that first ability will be more important and it really depends on how many more tokens you want or it's more how food centric your deck is c for right now but We'll find out. All right, next up is Root Rider Fawn. One colorless and a green for a creature. It's a Satyr Scout. It's a 1-3 and has tap, add one green, or pay one colorless and tap, add one man of any color. Uh, this is also a C. It doesn't have the upside of the rare, but, you know, depending on your curve, like, two mana for add one green has been in enough formats and has performed well enough 
it is a C and a respectable one. Next up, we have the Royal Treatment. One green for an instant. Target creature you control gains hexproof until end of turn. Create a Royal Roll token attached to that creature. And Royal is plus one, plus one, and more one. Um, you know, Tamio Safekeeping was a pretty good overperformer in its limited environment, as well was Tyvar's Stand. Now, those cards did give uh, Indestructible. Maybe this is more closely related to Snakeskin Veil. X proof and plus one, plus one counter. <clears throat> I think this is probably actually going to perform in the B range. I do think it's a little bit better than the C. But I, by no means do I think you should probably paint more than one copy of this effect. But the first copy should always probably act like a B. Being ready to save your <clears throat> card. Or whatever the best creature able to resolve is. All right, next up we've got the Sentinel of Lost Lore. A colorless green green for a creature. It's an elf knight. When Sentinel of Lost Lore enters the battlefield, choose one or more. Return target creature you own in exile that has an adventure to your hand. So, you know, you <clears throat> cast the adventure, it goes to exile, you get to cast the adventure again. There are some of the cards that I would definitely believe the adventure is better than the creature half. Also, funny enough thing, if your opponent somehow uses an exile removal on a creature that has an adventure, this gets it back. So that's pretty wild. All right. You can also put target card you don't own in exile that has an adventure on the bottom of its owner's library. So they play the instant sorcery part, then they play the permanent, and you get to put it on the bottom. That's also really powerful. And exile target player's graveyard. This card's really, really good. Of course, mm, it does kind of require you to have... Let's just say, if you don't have any cards with adventure in your deck, or any cards with adventure that you want to cast the adventure part again, this isn't going to be as good. It's probably only going to perform as an A, but if you get to ever just like, you know, Terminate? No. Terminus? Yeah. If you just get to Terminus... Sorry, you got a notification about something I didn't want. If you get to just Terminus one of their cards that's on Avenger, a big threat they're looking for, that is pretty good. And, uh, you know, exiling target player's graveyard is going to be pretty free every time. Mm, I was just wondering. It happens in this order. It's funny. If they'd have put the exile target player's graveyard first, you could, as the ability resolves, you could have exiled your own graveyard and then grabbed a creature out of exile that had an adventure, but it doesn't go in that order. So, yeah, A plus for Sentinel. All right, next up we've got Sky Beach Trekker. Three colorless and a green for a creature, Giant Archer. It's a 2-4. It's got reach. Whenever you cast a spell with mana value, five or greater, create a food. Um, this card is good. Those are all good stat lines, but I don't think it's going to perform all that better than a C. So we've got a C for this card. All right, next up we've got Spider Food. It's two colorless and a green for a sorcery. Destroy up to one target artifact, enchantment, or creature with flying. Create a food token. Um, hmm, all right, when, when you bring this card in your sideboard, if you're playing best of three, best of three, this card's pretty good, but it is still a sideboard card, so I'm going to put it in the D slot, but, um, in sealed, this will probably actually perform a little bit better, and, but it's actually probably going to be really good if you bring, oh, wait a minute, it's only a sorcery, never mind, I, for, I, I didn't really read it being a sorcery the first time, yeah, this card's, even a little bit worse than uh, these sideboard cards normally are. Yeah, yeah, leave Spider Food in D, but it is a sideboard card, so you'll bring it in enough. All right, next we have Storm Keld Vanguard. It's four colorless, green, green, for a creature, Giant Warrior. It's a 6 7, and it has uh, that it can't be blocked by creatures of power two or less. And it's also got an adventure, it's got Bear Down. Good joke. Colorless and a green for a sorcery. Destroy target artifact or enchantment. Man, six mana is like... You know, it's nice that they can't just, you know, pile a bunch of 2-2s two and 1-1 one one in front of it, but... Like, those things still costed enough mana, so you aren't 
horribly off with trading those off the battlefield for your 6-7 part of the time. Man, I'm tempted to just put this in C. Do I even think this is going to perform like a B? I don't know. Because, like, if I just chump block with three threes, it doesn't protect itself. And six is still a lot of mana. And the bear down being a free disenchant in your deck, I don't know how much that's going to matter. Mm, I think I will still put it in B somewhat begrudgingly, but... If it ended up performing like a C, hopefully it won't be too off. But then again, you do just need some of these bigger creatures, like get the game over part of the time. All right, next up we have Tangle Span Lookout, two colorless and a green for a creature. It's a satyr. It's a two three, and whenever an aura enters the battlefield under your control, draw a card. A lot of the times I wouldn't think this is very good, but the roll tokens definitely change the sculpt of that. Um, that new mechanic impeding on this, I do think I'll actually go ahead and give this card a B2. Your green decks are looking for their ways to get card advantage, and this is certainly what that is. Alright, next up, we have Territorial Witchstalker. Call us in a green for a creature, a wolf. It's a 2-3. It has a defender. At the beginning of combat on your turn, if you control a creature of power 4 or greater, Territorial Witch Stalker gets plus 1, plus 0 oh until end of turn, and can block this turn as though it didn't have defender. I think there was a dinosaur in a core set that had this line of text, and I want to say that card was pretty good, and I think this card's going to be pretty good too. There are a decent, maybe not a decent, decent amount, but there are enough creatures that have 4 power that you can actually play on turn three that's going to turn this card on and whenever you do that it's going to feel like a real beating for your opponent so c for territorial witch stalker all right next up we have thunderous debut six colorless and green green for a sorcery it has bargain look at the top 20 cards of your library you may reveal up to two creature cards from among them if this spell was bargained, put the reveal cards onto the battlefield. Otherwise, put the reveal cards in your hand and then shuffle. This card is an F. F Mega. It's got to be one of the worst cards in the whole set. Like, I don't know. Like, you could literally, like, it could say 8 mana, tutor up the best two green cards in this limited format. To literally say 8 mana. Put, choose two target creature cards from Wilds of Eldraine and put them on the battlefield, and they still wouldn't play this card. Eight mana is just such a ludicrous number, and it only searches 20. You know, your probably deck's going to be empty if you were to have accidentally drawn the two best creatures in your deck before you play this card. Like, you might end up just finding some, like, two, three... three. This card's terrible. Do not put it in your deck. Feel, and, you know, feel bad for the people who are going to put this card in their deck, because it's bad. All right, next up we have Titanic Growth. It's colorless and a green for an instant. Target creature gets plus four, plus four until end of turn. Uh, you know, seeing this card a lot, it's not nothing. You know, it'd be nice if there was some evasion, but four, four is a respectable amount of power and toughness for a colorless and a green. You're going to need enough of the time to win some combats, and every once in a while you'll reduce your life to opponent's life total zero with it that much for titanic growth let's see all right next up we have toadstool admirer it is a one green for a creature oof it's a one one with ward two and three colors and a green put a plus one plus one counter on toadstool admirer uh this card does wear some of your uh roll tokens pretty good but outside of that i'm not really excited about this card four Mana to put a plus one plus one counter on it is a lot. Uh, it probably is an okay one if you're really looking to curve out and beat down. If you've got lots of two mana spells that make uh, roll tokens to turn it on, that'll probably help. But uh, I'm not really excited about this card otherwise. Alright, next up we have Tough Cookie. A colorless and a green for an artifact creature, Food Golem. When Tough Cookie enters the battlefield, create a food token. Colorless and a green, target non-creature artifact you control, becomes a 4-4 four, four artifact creature until end of turn. Two colorless, sacrifice Tough Cookie, you gain three life. Okay, 
That middle part's kind of weird. It's been on some other cards I've played, and it normally doesn't work out that well. But, uh, you know, two green for a 2-2 two -two that makes a food, and you can sacrifice it for a food is pretty good. Helps turn on all your bargain cards, helps you gain life and stay alive. And, you know, two mana for a 2-2 two is never something you really turn down. Am I going to put this in A? Like, I kind of want to. I feel like this is just going to be an enabler for some of your gold shenanigans in the green-black deck. Or uh, the green-white. For green-white and green-black. It just feels like whenever you get a tough cookie, you're just going to turn on enough of your other cards that you're just going to want to play it. I, I think I'm going to put it in A. Maybe I should just put it in B. Nah, I'm leaving it in A. Stop me. You can't stop me. <laughs> All right, next up we have Troublemaker Oof. Call this in a green for a 2-2, and it has bargain. When it enters the battlefield, if it was bargain, exile, target, artifact, or enchantment, and opponent controls. Mm, I think this is still just going to play out like a C. You know, a lot of the times your opponent's not going to have a target for the ability, but you're not going to cut most of your 2-mana two 2-2s two most of the time. All right, next up we have Up the Beanstalk, Colorless and a Green for an enchantment. When Up the Beanstalk enters the battlefield, and whenever you cast a spell with value mana, mana value 5 or greater, draw a card. The card pretty good. I think I'm going to give it a B. Um, only for the sake of the fact I don't know. If you ever draw two cards off of this, it is pretty good. But I don't know how many 5 mana value spells you're going to want in your deck to reliably... Uh, get your second card off of this. You know, that will kind of tell, but I think B is a safe place to get. So just call this in a green, you know, sorcery speed draw a card. Going to help smooth out your draws enough. And if you only even have like three or four looking for this, it, it could help. We're, we're going to see. All right, next up we have Verdant Outrider. Two colorless and a green for a creature, Human Knight. It's a 4-2, and it's got colorless and a green. Verdant Outrider can't be blocked by creatures power two or less this turn. I really wish it would say only at sorcery speed, because I know that somebody is going to try attacking me with this 4-2. I'm going to move to block with my 2-2, and then after blockers is over, they're going to activate this ability and try and say it didn't block. And I'm like, nope, it sure did, and have to listen to them whine and cry about it not reading right. But still, otherwise than that, Vernon Outrider is a C. It is a pretty valuable C in the fact that it's a 3-mana 4-2 that helps turn on all of your 4 Four power matters stuff. All right, next up we have Virtue of Strength. This has got to be, I don't know, the blue one's pretty bad too, but this one's, ugh. Five colorless green green for enchantment. It's got, and it, for seven mana it says, if you tap a basic land for mana, it produces three times as much of that mana instead. So on turn eight, you can have access to 24 mana, as if there's a single card that you weren't able to cast already. That part is a total F. No reason to have the whole Virtue of Strength part. Garenbrig Growth is the sorcery, and it's an adventure. Return target creature or land from your graveyard to your hand. Now, that, like, one mana half a regrowth is only kind of playable. Like, the other ones I've explained before, like, you aren't cutting the adventure part from your deck pretty much any time. And so the other part, while being a little silly, is still very powerful. This, however, is only strictly silly. It's never really going to help. Like, that part doesn't help at all. And just return target, creature, or land. Just, like, you know, it's straight up just raise dead. It is a D. It's not quite in the F range. But I feel like every time you probably cast the 7 mana part, it then becomes an F. Ugh. This card just makes me groan. I can't help it. All right, next up we have, again, Welcome to Sweet Tooth. Call us in a green for a saga. Create a 1-1 one, one white human creature token. Chapter 2, create a food. Chapter 3, put X plus 1 plus 1 counters on target creature you control, where X is 1 plus the number of foods you control. So at worst, it is, you know, 3 mana suspend make us 3-3, three, three, which is not bad. And it's also an enchantment to sacrifice to your bargains. I could totally see you making the food. You know, making the creature, making the food, and then not even waiting for the church chapter and just going ahead and bargaining anyway. It is enough value, but I don't know if it's enough value for me to put it into the B range. But I could see, yeah, we'll, we'll put it in the high C. It is definitely a high C. I do not quite think it's 
a B, but I could be talking into it. We'll see later. All right, next up we have Mosswood Dread Knight. Uh, again, I put all the green creatures that have adventures, even if they're adventures in the same color and green. Call us in a green for a creature, Human Knight. It's a 3-2 with Trample. When it dies, you may cast it from your graveyard as an adventure until the end of your next turn. And the adventure is Dread Whisper. Call us in a black sorcery. You draw a card and you lose a life. Yeah. None of your, your green deck is never going to cut a 2-mana 3-2 Trampler. So I'm going to go ahead and put it in A. I could even see this if you can ever cast the black part. It's going to perform even better, especially if you can make sure to reliably cast it in the same turn as it dies. Yeah. All right, next up we have Gingerbread Hunter, four colors and a green. For a creature giant, it's a 5-5. Five, five. When it enters the battlefield, create a food token. And it also has an adventure, Puny Snack, two colors and a black for an instant. Target creature gets minus two, minus two until end of turn. I think this is a pretty reliable B. Not gonna waste that much time talking about it. It's good, just as the five mana five five make of food. It's even better if you can class the black part. Next up we have Questing Druid. Call us in a green for a creature. It's a human druid. It's a one-one. But whenever you cast a spell that's white, blue, black, or red, put a plus one plus one counter on Questing Druid. And it also has an adventure. Seek the beast, call us in a red for an instant. Exile the top two cards of your library until your next turn. You may play those cards. So more likely than not, you're going to play the red part during your opponent's turn in their end step and then cast the green side and hopefully you're going to be able to cast one of your other non-green spells the same turn you cast it that way it's not vulnerable to things like rat out and flick a coin and those other things that prey on the one toughness cards like we talked about mm, am i gonna put this in uh, all honesty this card's only really good if you can cast the red part without it it's a little weak uh, these kind of grow spells as you go thing because it's only one counter it still dies pretty easily to most of the halfway decent removal without it god this might only actually act like a c yeah i think i'm going to put this in the top end of c it could act like a if it, it is closer to an a if you can cast the red part but we'll see all right next up we have defense of the heart Three colorless and a green for an enchantment at the beginning of your upkeep. If an opponent controls three or more creatures, sacrifice Defense of the Heart. Search your library for up to two creature cards. Put those cards onto the battlefield. Okay, this card is... Am I going to call it an A? I've never, I've never played with a card like this at all. This feels like a really old card. I didn't actually look up to see when it was printed from. I'm going to give it a very cautious A because this ability does seem really strong. It is possible your opponent is playing some kind of control deck that doesn't have any creatures in it. But if they play any creatures at all, you just don't really try to destroy them. You just try to maybe make some bounce blocks or things that don't kill them. And then play this card. And then you get the two best creature cards out of your deck, which does feel pretty powerful. So I'm going to give it an A for the sake of experimentation. All right, next up we have Doubling Season, four colorless and a green for an enchantment. If an effect would create one or more tokens under your control, it creates twice that many instead. And if an effect would put one or more counters on a permanent you control, put twice that many of those counters on that permanent instead. Um, I'm going to give this a, an A+, plus, mostly because it's expensive, even though it's been reprinted two, time, two other times this year. It's still holding a pretty good price. But it also is very powerful. Uh, it is 5 mana to not affect the board. But as long as you don't die immediately after you cast it, it does double all of your food production, which is very significant. Um, there are plenty of creature tokens that can still block, and those help out a lot. The additional plus 1 plus 1 counter probably isn't coming that up, but... A plus for doubling season, just for the sake of, you know remembrance or whatever i don't know all right next up we have garuk's uprising two colorless and a green for an enchantment when garuk's uprising enters the battlefield if you control a creature of power four or greater draw a card creatures you control have trample when a very creature of power four or greater you control enters the battlefield draw a card um 
this was in a core set that I played a lot, but I don't remember playing green a whole lot in that format. Let me get this card in A. Um, I think I'm going to put Garouk's Uprising in B. But, depending on if you're in draft, you would just prioritize all of the four Power Matters stuff a little bit more. I could see it trending towards A, but we might have to see. I think B is a safe enough grade. All right, next up we have Ground Seal, Colas, and a Green. When it airs a battlefield, draw a card, and cards can't be the targets of spells or abilities. Um, I think this card's kind of an F. I don't think you really need to prioritize it at all. Uh, just two minutes to draw one card, not really that effective. And the cards in the graveyard thing kind of flavor text. Maybe it could be a sideboard card, but I doubt it. All right, next up is Hardened Scales. Hardened Scales is also an F. Hardened Scales, although it being constructed power level playable, is that way because it helps all cards that were already good go from flexible but inefficient to just really good. And that's why Hardened Scales is so powerful, but you don't have access to these cards in that limited format, so it's just going to only kind of make your cards okay just a little bit better, and it's not going to be a good removal spell, a good roll in anything else. All right, next up is Leyline of Abundance. Two colorless and two green for an enchantment. If it's in your opening hand, you can begin the game with it on the battlefield. Whenever you tap a creature for a mana, add an additional green and six colorless and two green. Put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control. This card is also an F. I would not encourage you to put this card in your deck ever. It's just not going to be worth it. Trust me. Next up, we have Nature's Will. Two colorless and green green for an enchantment. Whenever one or more creatures you control deals combat damage to a player, tap all lands that player controls and untap all lands you control. So, I guess you just always get to tap out. I am very tempted with these kinds of cards, because, like, the tapping all of your opponent's lands is a little whatever. But if you're able to tap out and even just kind of get in with a couple of things, like, maybe only chump attack with... Chump attack with two, make a middling block or a trade with another one. Um, I'm going to put this in... I'm only going to put this in D. Yeah, it is still four mana to not do anything. Maybe tap out for this, get a little bit of damage in. Maybe if you were somehow to play this in like green, blue, or green, white, and have a flyer, and then attack, get to untap and have access to all of your mana again, it could be pretty good, but who knows. Oh gosh, parallel lives, three colorless and a green. If an effect if an effect would create one or more tokens you control, create twice that many instead. I'm going to give it an A. I don't really want to, but it is a powerful effect, and if you get to double all of your foods like I was talking about before, it is very, very good. Alright, next up we have Primal Vigor, four colorless and a green, and this is essentially double season again. Four colorless and a green. For an enchantment, if one or more tokens you control will be created twice that many of those are created instead, and if a plus one plus one counter will be put on a creature twice that many are put on instead, I'm going to give it an A+, plus because it is very expensive. If you see it in draft, you should probably take it. And uh, the, the effects are relevant. It doubles up all your food, it makes your creatures more powerful, yada yada yada. Alright, next up we have Prismatic Omen, colorless and a green for enchantment. Lands you control are every basic type in addition to their other types. This is an F. Do not put this card in your deck. Alright, next up we have Season of Growth, colorless and a green for an enchantment. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, scry one. Whenever you cast a spell that targets a creature you control, draw a card. This card I'm actually going to give a C. The scry one helps out a lot, and uh, the targeting thing will come up more often since all of your fight spells have to target a creature you control. So that's a good draw there. All right, next up we have a Nitro Growth. Colorless, green, green, green. At the beginning of each combat, double the power and toughness of each creature you control until end of turn. I think this card is also an F. I saw plenty of people play in Innistrad Midnight Hunt Limited, and those people lost a lot. And last but not least, we have Utopia Sprawl. Green for an Enchantment Aura, Enchant Forest. As Utopia Sprawl enters the battlefield, choose a color. When Enchanted Forest is tapped for mana, its controller adds an additional one mana of the chosen color. Uh, we don't have Arbor Elf, so we're not going to be, you know, making four mana on turn two. But it is still a really neat card, and it is definitely going to help you fix. And it's going... 
It'll help you fix, and it helps you ramp. It is a good enough card for what your green decks are looking to do. Okay, so that is green, everyone. Please like, comment, subscribe, and share this to your friends who are trying to get better at Limited. Um, the playlist will be here in the end of the video, and we're going to be moving on to the next one soon. Thank you so much for your time. Goodbye.